Um, so without further ado, we're gonna get started. Um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Helen Vaughn to give opening remarks uh, today for this session. She is a, an associate professor at Howard University in Washington, DC. She's a former director of the Center for Excellence in Teaching, Learning and Assessment at Howard. She's a Fulbright Nehru scholar to India, and she's also the co-chair of SDSN USA and a co-chair of our most recent working group, the Diversity, Equity and Justice for Sustainable Development Working Group. Um, thank you so much, Helen, for joining and for giving us some context uh, before we head into our presentations today. I'd like to say thank you and welcome and good morning to all, wherever you are, whatever part, time of the day. Thank you, Sonia, for that wonderful introduction. And I wanna say a special thank you to my colleague and friend and co-chair, Claudia Edelman. And so I'm so pleased to be here. Uh, I wanna start off as a longtime educator, my remarks will be brief so we can go into our uh, research panels. But I, I do wanna say how special these heritage months really are and are to me. And I know there's a critique around that from the education world. You know, it's one month out of a year. And that critique has some gravitas. Hispanic heritage is important. It's a part of American heritage. Uh, it should be celebrated more than one month out of a year, 12 months out of a year. But we'd like to keep in mind that it's a start, not a finish. And it's a beginning, but not an end. And speaking of new beginnings, I want to just, and I often do this because I, I think demographics are important. They tell an important story about our country. And I've been following the new US Census demographics. And speaking of new beginnings, the US Census data found that the multiracial population in the United States, which includes all of us, grew 276%. The Latino population grew by 23%. Uh, the white non-Hispanic population only grew by 4.3%. White population still the largest, uh, actually shrank by 8.6% since 2010. You know, but we know that demographics are often not destiny. Uh, Claudia shared with me some uh, wonderful toolkit with I shared with Howard University, had wonderful information, wonderful PowerPoints, and we found out that we actually had some students in our higher education program that were actually re researching his, uh, Hispanic heritage. And so I'm hoping some of them have joined us. I see our numbers are going up. We sent that out over our social media. But I was reviewing it for myself, and I was really surprised at, at some of the information. Happy at some, but disheartening at others. For example, uh, I found out that 86%, and I think this is an important statistic for all of us to remember and to embrace, 86% of all new businesses in the United States in the last 10 years was launched by Hispanics. That's an amazing statistic. And, and Hispanics are young, six out of 10 uh, Hispanics are millennial or younger. That means they are a growing sector of our future consumers, our innovators, our scientists, and our teachers. Yet, as I was reviewing the material, great disparities still exist. And I could go on, but I, I was really disheartened. Uh, Hispanics are only 3% of the total seats in our boardrooms across the United States yet they are 86% of all new business owners. Only 1% of all elected and appointed officials in the United States are Hispanic. And Hispanic women, Latinas, earn 33% on the dollar less than do white men. You know, this is, is it's really a travesty. And, um, um, and I think that's why this research panel and what we're doing and must continue to do is so important. But I want to, to leave you on a higher note here. And, you know, this is something new I learned. We included this story very quickly, and then we're going to move on. In a, uh, a monograph document that Elena Lynch led with myself and some others uh, entitled Never More Urgent, we told the story. And it's a story not well known of Sylvia Mendez. 
We all know the story of Brown v. Board, but what led to Brown v. Board? Well, Mendez v. Westminster was seven years before Brown v. Board and made and just made amazing things. Let me just, just recap it very quickly. Um, Sylvia Mendez received the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Obama in 2011 uh, on behalf of her parents who filed uh, on the behalf of 5,000 Mexican-American students in Orange County, California, making California the first state in the nation to end school desegregation. Uh, and her testimony as a nine-year-old girl led, led this. And she is now uh, is a civil rights activist. She's a friend of Chapman University uh, in California and continues to, to uh, tell the story. And I was very pleased as I end here, I'm a great uh, promoter of children's literature to teach all young people about these heroes. And there's a wonderful book uh, by her and someone else called Separate is Never Equal by Sylvia Mendez. And so I'd like to leave you on the celebration of her and go into our research panel. And again, thank you for allowing me to say these few words. Thank you very much. Uh Thank you. I think it is, um, um, I'm going to um, have a very hard time in following your footsteps, but I do want to pay a tribute to your leadership, Helen. And uh, thank you so much for celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month and passing all those facts. The fact that 77% of our Latino population doesn't even know how many we are, how young we are, they don't know uh, the, you know, like the basic data of our own community and the census has been incredible, as you mentioned. So I think that the more we can have people that are taking the data and sharing the data, becoming factivists in a way, um, it's going to allow for a community that has felt voiceless for so long to get a voice and that community has felt powerless for so long, just get power. So thanks for that. Thank you uh, for SDSN USA for partnering with World Human and with Hispanic Star in this very exciting research panel. Throughout Hispanic Heritage Month, I've been speaking to the important realization that the time for now, the time for Latinos is now. Uh, I've been talking about how the dam is breaking, the water is leaking, and it is important to recognize the Hispanic community for their contributions to the country throughout history now and in the future. But um, pretty much as you were saying, uh, um, Helen, the, the incredible point here is the census, right? Like for the next 10 years, we're, we're gonna have a tool that helps us realize that America is a multi-racial country and that America's made of stars and any one of us is one. Hispanics are one of them too. So this is an opportunity for us, has been an opportunity for us, this Hispanic Heritage Month, to be unapologetic about shining a light in the community, elevating the voices, uh, making sure that we equip as many people as possible in singing from the same song sheet and inviting people to sing from the same song sheet at the same time. So what we're trying to do is break through the noise, understand that we need to have more and more stories on us, more and more researchers, more and more panels dedicated to us. And so I think that we're very optimistic about what we're seeing every time. I think that we have, we are counting more than 100 companies that didn't do, uh, didn't celebrate Latinos at all. And now we're celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month this year. So I truly believe that data is the key for organizations like ours to keep moving, to keep activating, to keep mobilizing. So pretty much I'm honored to expand both my insights and yours with the presentation of these three great research projects that will be presented today from SDSN US members. It is inspiring and we're honored to be able to support through this platform and elevate your great work. A special, very special thank you to SDSN, SDSN USA and the team for partnering with us in making this conversation come to life. So thanks for joining, and I would love to pass it on to the greatest, Sonia Nev, to introduce the first presentation. Thanks so much, Sonia. Thanks, Claudia, and thank you, We're All Human, for the great partnership on this and for all of the events you're running throughout Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, if you want to share any of those in the chat, I'm sure other, other folks in the audience would be interested in seeing what else 
has been going on and, and for the remaining week or so that uh, Hispanic Heritage Month continues. Um, but I am excited to head into the panel and I just wanted to remark on not only how uh, this Hispanic Heritage Month has been so great for elevating the voices uh, of the Hispanic community and the research being done on the community, but also the way that the SDGs can work to make sure that we don't leave any communities behind um, and we really spread awareness in, in those communities. Um, so I'm just really excited to dive into that in uh, the data that folks are going to be sharing with us today. Um, and so I'd like to start uh, by giving the floor to the first presentation. It's called the Western New York COVID-19 Research Collaborative Underserved Communities and Schools Vac Vaccination Project. It will be presented by Dr. Jean Morse, a SUNY Distinguished Professor at University of Buffalo, State University of New York, and Dr. James Moeller, Chief Inner, sorry, I've lost my script, um, in, in their in institutional academics and Professor of Oncology at Roswell Park Comprehensive C Cancer Center. Uh, as well as many other uh, long list here of affiliations. Um, Dr. Morrison, Dr. Muller, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to your presentation. I'll give you the floor. Great, thanks very much. And congratulations to all of you on all of these activities. And uh, it's wonderful to be, to be a part. What I wanted to do very quickly, I actually got introduced to SDSN through uh, global capacity building programs that I worked on in Africa and in the Caribbean. And that motivated us to want to become a part of SDSN USA and to actually apply what we do around the world to communities within the US. And uh, when, when COVID first started, uh, I usually tell people I'm an HIV researcher uh, so that kind of stopped for a while when COVID-19 took over. And I wasn't sure if we had folks who were coming in from out of the country. So I put this slide. Aside. So you know where New York is. So Western New York are the Western counties. And the uh, diagram on the right just illustrates our attempt to bring together all of the different groups that normally don't work together. COVID-19 started. And at that time, we were really trying to work toward bringing hospitals together. But as vaccines were developed uh, and the community engagement really took uh, front and center, we really began to view our network as a link between established research programs and communities. So that's how we uh, got to having this collaborative. Uh, I started out with a diagram like this, just showing you not necessarily the individual groups, but kind of programs that were more academic and research focused, hospitals, primary care, businesses, community and government. And over time, I couldn't even actually keep up with this diagram because we had so many people that really wanted to participate. And the list here is just to really reflect all of these different types of underserved communities, everybody kind of wanting to figure out how do we link to clinical care? How do we get involved with the newest research uh, protocols, whether it be for treatment, vaccination, et cetera. And that's how this collaborative, I think, actually came to be uh, much more integrated within the community. So the mission that we set out for was really to develop something that does happen. I don't think it's unique, but uh, we really were trying to do something that links research to community. We took two of our larger institutions, University of Buffalo and Roswell Park Cancer Center, tried to bring all of the resources that those programs have to the community level. And we also worked with local businesses to fill in the gaps, because again, these the community was not where research was usually done. And then we also were trying to develop a sustainable model for this once COVID subsided and link it to another program that we were developing around uh, drug and vaccine development. So that's a little bit about the collaborative. Western New York, so I actually grew up near New York City, on Long Island, and I was very used to the multicultural aspects of the metropolitan area. And when I came to Buffalo quite a while ago, 
I was really excited about the fact of all the different types of individuals that, for different reasons, had come to Buffalo. Uh, just to give you an example of the types of uh, welcoming that came to this region, uh, here's just one organization of Journeys and Refugee Services. And uh, really to focus more on this month, uh, I wanted to mention a little bit about the Hispanic Heritage Council that was started. Uh, the history here is probably, uh, I came to Buffalo right around 1980. So right around that time, a number of groups were trying to come together to kind of have a critical mass. And I, I won't go through all of the uh, information here, but you can see that over 20, 30 years, there was an effort to kind of create uh, an efficient group that could work together and move things forward for the community. Uh, when the Hispanic Heritage Council was formed around 2010, uh, it was led by Casimiro Rodriguez, who I think is on the call with us today, and has recently been uh, leadership change to Esmeralda Sierra. And the idea was to build this into the culture of the community and, and really build on everything that was said in the introduction by Professor Bob. Uh, this is just a little bit of the area uh, in Buffalo, in the downtown area, a number of streets feed into the main hub. Niagara Street is one of them. And there's been a real uh, push on the part of the Hispanic Heritage Council to really showcase what, what goes on, uh, what's the history, how do we get to where we are, and where are we going forward. But working with the community, there's also a number of federally qualified health centers. They're also in our collaborative. And uh, our challenge was to try to create a network where patients and individuals in these communities who get their care here could be a part of an organized approach. And on Niagara Street in Buffalo, certainly Dr. Raul, Raul Vasquez is our healthcare leader. And he has organized a number of different programs. And I would just encourage you, if you're really looking for what, what should be done, uh, he has been a leader in making quality healthcare linked to the community. And I can't really say enough about the program. So the collaborative is trying to do interesting things Everything we wanted to do with uh, treatment and diagnostics was put on the side for vaccine research. And the challenges that were faced here were that the communities often receive health care at sites that are not linked to some of our research rich resources. And there's a number of factors in different communities that keep them from getting linked. And there are many organizations that are dedicated to help underserved communities, but they're also not working together. And so we felt that a lot of health of the health inequities that were emerging during COVID could be addressed through an alternative system. Uh, simply one of the projects we were trying to get at was once vaccine was available, uh, how could the regional vaccine plan be augmented so that underserved communities uh, would have greater access. Uh, we, we actually found ourselves now dealing with vaccine hesitancy, which is a global challenge. But if you are able to get a vaccine, we also want to try to understand who can sustain their immunity and who might get reinfected. So there's a lot of interesting questions that should be addressed, uh, not only once you know, someone gets so this is kind of the project where we are at now, trying to implement a project for back to school and work. And I'm really not gonna go through all of these details, but what I wanted to show you is that we really see our collaborative is trying to build a coordination platform. The platform is really trying to help groups that are already doing good things, but are doing them in isolation. They're not connected. And there's not a lot of data being collected on what's being done and how it should be modified, et cetera. So that brings us you know, really to this collaborative idea. And so what the collaborative is doing is working with the community engagement, 
lot of the organizations in underrepresented areas of our uh, Erie County and Niagara County, and trying to bring together other groups who could actually strengthen this effort. And, you know, because of time today, we can't go through all of this, but the technology exists to do this. And that's what we're setting out to do. And we're bringing in individuals, uh, for example, those in STEM training programs, where schools are where we want to have an impact and we have networks of programs in schools, but they're not working on these types of issues. Uh, we have other types of programs that are trying to help uh, kids in underserved areas get into science and technology. We're bringing them into this initiative. And then we're really working with a local uh, collaboration that's trying to address health equity in general and trying to get everybody to participate in a similar project. So the vision of this collaborative is that provided, by providing a regional network, we could actually get people to work together. By doing that, there's no reason that underserved communities cannot be gaining the same access to all aspects during COVID-19 that other communities do. And that there's a lot of opportunities that we can talk about during the panel for building on this type of strategy. And my last slide or two goes back to earlier SDSN activity with the Lancet COVID-19 Commission that was already thinking about how to build back after COVID subsides so that health equity uh, aren't as prominent as they are. And we felt that although I have summarized here a variety of the aims of that commission, I have highlighted the, uh, the last one to accelerate and adopt creative solutions that are already being implemented regionally on a worldwide basis. So many of the things that we're trying to do here in Western New York, we're also trying to do in Jamaica and Zimbabwe. And there's really nothing stopping this type of planning, except that it doesn't usually go on that way. So I will just stop there and thank the organizers for inviting us. Dr. Moeller can address most of the questions we really wanted to acknowledge some of the seed grant support that we got to get this program off the ground. Thank you so much, Dr. Morris and Dr. Moeller. And uh, I know that there was so much more you could dive into. So I apologize for the limited amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we can have, you know, another event where we can really dive into some of those details because it was really interesting and really really great work on public health and SDG3 health and well-being. Um, uh, I just want to let the audience know we do have Q&A open, so uh, you can address your questions to Dr. Morris and Dr. Moeller in that box. Uh, I did have one question that I can ask now. Um, I was really fascinated by the collaborative community model used in this project, and it sounds like a great way to conduct COVID-19 research without leaving anyone behind as uh, the SDGs call for the leave no one behind agenda um, and with minority communities in mind. Um, and I think the SDG agenda is all about taking local cases like this and applying them to other regions. So I'm wondering if this model could be used elsewhere uh, and what potential ways you could see it expanded or used for other Hispanic SDG related research. Um, so either of you, if you could answer that question. Jim, do you want to mention? Maybe the programs that Roswell has in community based engagement? Yeah, uh, I like to think of COVID 19 as providing unintended consequences. And one of them is that it's helping us recognize that we're all in the same boat. It has certainly helped us, like the conference we're having right now, it's helped develop telemedicine. Uh, and I like to think that a residual of our addressing the COVID-19 emergency will be an improvement in preventative health care and early detection of uh, cancer, which is what I do. Uh, and so this type of collaborative interaction uh, will serve us well way after COVID-19 is in our rear view mirror or at least is uh, part of a regular old flu shot. So we all look forward to that time, but we need to take advantage of what we're learning now and apply it throughout the entire healthcare uh, system. 
Absolutely. And, and bouncing off of that, we had got another question about these being lasting changes in terms of equality. Telemedicine is definitely here to stay. Um, do, are there political ramifications for this? Can we start to work towards care for all based on this model or the connections that you've made in, in the region um, throughout this project? I mean, I'm usually an optimist that, you, that we can. Uh, I think what I was trying to say in my introduction is that we, we have to do that strategy when we're working with low to middle income countries because there is no opportunity to leave people out. You have to have all the resources come together. I think particularly in the US, you know, we're not used to doing that. Everybody has their own program with their own funding. This, that won't solve the problem that we're trying to get at right now with COVID. And so this is a great opportunity to make this model move forward. Now, one of the things about a collaborative is it's, it's usually a bunch of people who wanna do the same thing and they have no funding to do it. So I think that we also create a very strong mechanism to seek funding when we bring all of these different pieces together. And so I'm optimistic we can go forward with it. Uh, it's just a matter of kind of changing the paradigm and getting people to, getting the funders to uh, support that type of effort. A lot of grants, you know, they often require stakeholder letter of support, but it really doesn't push people to actually change what's being done. And I think that's what's needed to make it go forward this way. Yeah, and it's interesting in the same way that uh, Dr. Muller also remarked on how that is kind of an unintended consequence of COVID-19, bringing this to the forefront, making it something that lots of people are interested in working on. And, and hopefully we can get that kind of interest on other issues that uh, harm minorities and other in the public health space. Um, so thank you so much again for your work and for mentioning your connection to SDSN USA. Um, if any attendees do have further questions for this project, you can put them in the Q&A box um, and Dr. Morris and Dr. Muller can answer them over chat or we can talk about them at the end. Um, but I think we will move on to our next uh, panelist unless there are any more questions at the last minute here. I can wait one second. Well, thanks again for that presentation. Um, I think we're gonna move on to our second presentation. Um, yeah, and there's some nice comments in the chat. Um, Lydia Perez, a student at Saybrook University is going to share with us through storytelling, what pivotal leaders did uh, in my first generation experience to foster an internalized sense of belonging that allows me to lead through towards thriving. Uh, thank you so much, Lydia, for joining, and we look forward to learning more about your research. Thank you so much, Sonia. Good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone. My name is Lydia Perez, coming to you from Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm going to share the preliminary uh, ideation of my PhD research at Saybrook University. I do want to start out by first saying that my research itself is going to the, the population is first generation students. But if you were to look into any research, I'm sure you would find that the majority of Hispanic students, unfortunately, would probably pin themselves in the term um, first generation. And for those of you who require a definition, um, in my professional work, uh, first generation students are students whose parents or the people who provide them their most support at home do not have bachelor's degrees um, or four-year degrees here in the United States. So though my research is going to focus on, on first-generation students, I feel it's viable um, to Hispanic students specifically. Um, and that's coming from my own personal experience as a um, first-generation student who happens to be Hispanic. So why this research? I was actually um, thrown into this research due to an event that I'll talk more about in the next slide, um, but also my career. I've spent the last 25 years working with first generation low income students um, in federally funded TRIO programs um, at colleges and universities throughout the United States. Um, and so I've had to watch for years students with who are more than capable, students who are passionate, um, languish, um, and not see themselves worthy of a post-secondary education when they have all that they need uh, to succeed intellectually, academically, uh, yet there is something that impedes their progress. 
and I've struggled with finding out how we can address that. Um, just a few numbers. 21% um, of the Hispanic population who's 25 and older um, have attained a bachelor's degree. That's in comparison to 61% of Asian students and 41% of and 61% also of white eligible 25 or plus adults. So there's a huge gap in regards to educational attainment between the Hispanic population and other populations. Um, COVID has brought into great light, um, as you could tell from our first presentation, the existing gaps that have existed in many areas of our life. Education is no exception to what COVID brought to the forefront. Um, for instance, 4% of Hispanic or Latino students do not have a computer in their home. And for the last going on 21 months now, all education has pretty much been put on a computer. And when 4% of a population doesn't even have access to one at home, how is education being received in that household and by that student? Also, 8% of Hispanic students don't have broadband at home. So how would they, even if they had a computer, how would they access the classroom? 21% of first-generation low-income students complete a bachelor's degree in six years. That's compared to 66% of students who are not first-generation or are not low-income students. Again, a monstrous gap. Um, and that's what I want to alleviate as an educator, as an equity professional. I want that gap to tighten and to not exist. And yet even, um, and I think educators had noted this gap early on. And so initiatives were created 20, 30 years ago. There was the inception of mentoring programs at post-secondary institutions, access to education. Post-secondary education was widened um, to allow more students into the colleges and universities here in the United States. There was bridge programs created for incoming university freshmen to get acclimated. Uh, there are success courses that students are required to take that are supposed to equip them with skills and tools to help them uh, succeed in the classroom and in the campus environment. And yet those numbers that I just gave you are from 2021 research. So those initiatives, those programming have not dwindled the gap. Why is that? Um, that kind of leads me to think that there's something besides the exterior in a first generation Hispanic student, something besides the environment around them that impedes their success. And that's when I started to reflect on my own experience as a first generation Latina college student. Um, how did I succeed? How do I find myself sitting where I am? Um, I consider myself a thriving human being. And that's why I was pushed to um, pursue PhD work because I want to figure out what it is internally that may prohibit students from succeeding in post-secondary education. My work is going to be autoethnographic and methodology. And essentially what that means is that for this research, I am the participant. I am the sole participant. So I'm going to explore narratives in my life um, that seem to perpetuate the phenomenon that I want to explore. And I chose ethnography because one of the key components to that methodology is that I can speak to an epiphany or I can write about an epiphany that happened in my life that changed my course of thinking, that changed how I view the world. And, um, and that's what I'm going to write about. And I'm, going, I'm not gonna share the whole event, but essentially what happened is in 2012, I left my career of 17 years at a public four-year university where I was successful, the program was successful but I decided to up and leave. And I moved almost 1500 miles away from my home state of Arizona to a new position at a new college. And when I got there, I learned that I would be the supervisor of the individual who had been running the program that I was going to supervise and manage. And that the person who was the assistant supervisor to that program was also the second person not selected for the position. I was selected over that individual. And at that moment, I felt uneasy, um, but I kind of let it go. I then went on, so that was meeting with leadership. I then met with the individual 
and we started chatting. And because of the leadership and mentorship that I had received in my past as an early professional, um, I needed to know how she was running things because in my mind, she was the leader. She was supervising the project and I'm here to learn from her until I've learned enough. And then I will assume my leadership role. When I told her that, she kind of uh, expressed to me that she was really wanting to dislike me because obviously she was not selected for the position and I was. And at that moment, it hit me that I was not going to stay and that it was in the best interest of that individual in her pursuit of thriving as a professional and as a human that she assumed leadership of that program because she had already been doing it for six months, a year. And so we finished our impromptu meeting. And the first thing I did was I called one of my mentors from years past. And I told the mentor what my plan was and what I intended to do. Needless to say, I spent about 28 days at the location giving her training and skills and walking her through what she would need to assume leadership. And then I resigned and I came back home, not knowing if I had a job, not knowing where I was going to live, but not once was I fearful of those outcomes. For some reason, I knew what I was meant to do at that moment was to help that professional reach the next stage in her professional development. And that there was so much more tied to it than just the job title. Her sense of self, her sense of worth was tied to her being able to say that someone believed in her to assume that position. Um, we kept in touch, we still keep in touch. Um, but I get asked, and I even asked myself, why did I feel inclined to do what I did? Um, and that's when it came to me that it wasn't about any kind of academic preparation I'd had in classes. It wasn't about just because I had a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. It was because there was people early on in my life who told me that when something was right for me, then, and I knew it was right for me, then that was the right road to take. And there was no questioning that. And that I had to believe in myself enough to take risks and trust in my own gut instinct. And that's what I want to study because I think that's the difference for first generation and I would say in particular Hispanic students when we're usually the first ones in our family to step foot on a college campus. We need to know that someone believes in us and someone and that we can trust our intuition and we can trust what we think is best. Not just in our education as college students, but what happens after when we become first generation professionals in the workplace, to trust ourselves, to trust in our strength. So my research, I feel, is going to be multi-steps, multi-years, but I felt I first needed to start with my understanding of that experience and how I contribute my sense of thriving and the form of leadership that I possess to the people who led me and mentored me. So I want to spend my PhD dissertation research on exploring what did those leaders do to, for me, say to me, show me in action that provided me a strong sense of internalized belonging. And I'm gonna to touch a little bit on that because I think there's a difference between the belonging that we see and hear about today and the belonging I know I experience in my life on a daily basis. So belonging, if we, we could go to Maslow's, you know, hierarchy of needs, if you're a Brene Brown fan, she talks a lot about belonging. It's, first of all, I want to say it's a human need. As a human, we need to feel like we have relevance in our existence and relevance to the people around us um, and that we have worth, interpersonal worth in those relationships. So that's in the humanity of belonging. But also within education, um, post-secondary education in particular, is that students cannot stay in school if they do not have a sense of belonging at their institution. Because again, it's that, it's that human need. I need to feel like I belong not only here in my home amongst my family, I need to feel like I belong in every aspect of my life, at my work, 
And then as a college student, I need to feel like my campus believes that I belong. The faculty there believe I belong there. The students believe I belong there. And it's a, so it's, it can be different than what we get from our immediate circle of people in our lives. Um, so yeah, that's, and, and in the early research in, in post-secondary education, belonging was like, um, like Vincent Tinto would say, it's up to the student to join organizations, become engaged with the campus so that they can nurture uh, from the outside in this sense of belonging. Um, there's newer research out there that kind of is now speaking to the sense of what can campuses do to provide students an environment that makes them feel um, a sense of belonging. And I think that's kind of key because I think it does have to come from all of these different areas. But what I want to touch on in my research is something that I'm going to title internalized belonging because that's just the way that I visualize it or it has meaning for me. And a perfect way to uh, describe it, I found it recently. I recently read Across That Bridge by John, Congressman John Lewis. And he has a quote in one of the chapters where he says, my upbringing, my community, my faith gave me confidence because it was not based on an external definition of our value. We knew we were children of the divine. So we believed in our own worth, regardless of what the world might say. I want my research to train educational leaders to help students reach this feeling of belonging, because that's what I believe I possess. And that's what I believe allows me to make choices in my life for the good of others. But then in the end, it's also for the good of me. And I assume risk when it's for the common good. Because what this talks about is that I'm already going to walk onto the campus believing that I'm worth being there and believing that I have value and that it's a return on investment for me to be at that campus. It doesn't speak to the externalized sense of how we can give belonging to a student by having them engage in clubs or by having them join Greek life or by having them um, be a, have a mentor. The students would already come to the campus believing in their worth. I want to, and I believe that leadership is one of the ways that we haven't explored yet on how we can see belonging happen on a college campus, create a culture of belonging on a college campus. And in my mind, it has to come from a leader of a campus. I do believe that there are some current leadership approaches that um, help right now currently foster and nurture belonging. Um, but they're in pockets. So servant leadership, if you're familiar with that, it's founded mostly from religious um, affiliations, but it's gaining popularity, especially in the post-secondary education field. Um, servant leadership talks more about someone who leads from behind and a leader who works for the good of his or her team before the good of themselves. Um, and where their focus is, how can I make my teams, my clients, my students, if we're coming from an education background, how can I see them thrive? Because from that is where we'll see the increase in loyalty, productivity. It'll just, when everyone is happy and thriving, then our work will show the same impact. But I guess for me and my personal narrative and why I'm picking out ethnography is because I believed I, I had special leaders and mentors in my life who, who showed me that, who showed me every day. And there wasn't, and it's, the mentorship is something that is happening all the time. And it's a different kind of mentorship, which is also going to be another part of future research. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna start with my stories first. And then after that, explore other stories and find commonalities. And my hope is that from those common themes that I find from all first generation students, I'll be able to then share with leaders, here's what students need from you. And here's what they need from the culture of a college campus in order for them to realize their goals. So in the end, my hopes or my aspirations, and again, this is a multifaceted research I realize now, I'm not going to be done after this PhD is realized, um, there'll be more work and research to do.
But you can see here, what are the hopes of my impact of my research? Is that I do delve and realize if there is something like internalized belonging, and if that's something that needs to be researched further, and how can we ensure that all humans have that sense of internalized belonging? Um, bring to the forefront education leadership practices and behaviors. And I think what we'll see from that is I talked about some pretty you know, bleak numbers in the beginning. I think those numbers would change because when someone believes in themselves, they're better equipped to succeed. So I think retention and completion data for first generation students would rise, which also means that for Hispanic students in college, they would see improvements in that data. And then finally, I think I wanna inspire research um, that focuses on first generation students, Hispanic students, African-American students, any marginalized population, I want to hear their stories because that's another beauty of ethnography and autoethnography is that people who have been marginalized will finally have a voice because right now they don't. Um, we may talk a great talk here in the US about what we do for all people, but there are so many people who don't feel like anyone's listening to them. And I want my research to give voice to people who don't feel like they're educational path and needs have been addressed or listened to. That was rushed, I apologize. I'm happy to address any questions. And I'm also happy for any comments. Like I said, I'm in the midst of, in autoethnography, I'm still processing um, my narratives and bringing meaning to them and, and looking at them critically. So I'm also, um, I'm smack dab in the middle of my exploration. So also any comments about that, I would greatly appreciate. Um, so thank you so much for your time. I will turn it over to the next round or two questions. Thank you so much, Lydia. Um, and I just wanna first thank you so much for sharing your personal experience with us. I mean, that was really interesting to hear and, and I, I really appreciate that you were willing to uh, dive into it. Um, I see we're getting some really nice comments in the chat. Um, please direct any questions to Q&A because I'd be happy to read them. One that I received was um, about how you see your findings of this research contributing to the Hispanic SDG research agenda or policy agenda and how we can use the findings to draw a light on the experiences of young people and start to close the gap that you mentioned in your presentation. When I first started uh, my PhD program, you know, you do introductions and the first, and I still say it today is, I want to change post-secondary education in the United States. I wanna change how we structure education. And I think my research and by hearing the voices of so many students in my research, people will start to listen. And I think I'm focusing on leaders because I have to focus on the people who right now can make that change. And with all due respect to myself in the position I sit in currently at my community college, I can't make those changes. I can't change the whole culture of a campus. I can change the culture of my small little department. Um, but what I want my research to impact is a whole system of education. And so I think, but I also think my research is like the beginning seed of a tree that's going to have to be planted and nurtured for many years to come. And I think it's just the beginning. And I think there's a lot of research out there that touches on this need to change the system, but in many different ways. I think my focus on this sense of belonging and this internalized strength that we can give to people um, is a little bit different than what's out there now currently. Um, but yeah, my hope is I wanna change how education is given, perceived, believed, in the United States because that's what has to happen or else we're gonna sit in the same cycle of education that we sit in now. Right, thanks for that. And I really appreciate the uh, use of storytelling as the tool to try and make these changes. Do you think that you could expand a little bit about you know, the opportunity or the role that storytelling can play in this research agenda or this achievement of increased equality? Absolutely. Um, and it's not without fear that I do my PhD dissertation using autoethnography. Um, because I'm not, you know, I've read, you read up as a PhD student about methodologies, and I'm not sure that autoethnography has gained the level of respect that it deserves. But I have to start somewhere. And I have to feel like I have to be an example to other students. Because like my next round of research will be 
now that I've heard from myself and come to grips with my own experience, I want to, I'm going to hear from other first generation students and I want them to know that I've walked that journey and I'm going to walk with them in it. Um, I think we just need to do more of it. I think more researchers have to be courageous enough to take on storytelling. I think academia as a whole needs to start embracing the value of storytelling. If you think of all the cultures on earth, I can think of few where storytelling is not centralized and paramount to that civilization and what it was based on. Some of the greatest civilizations in the world, the focal point was storytelling, and yet we've left that. We've kind of disregarded it. I'd like to bring that back, but it can't just be me. It, it has to be other researchers, researchers more renowned, uh, researchers more studied than me. Um, but I can tell you now, even as a service professional, even as an equity professional, what I do in service to my students, every day I end up telling a story to my students because I know that's how they'll relate to what I'm trying to convey to them. We do it all the time. So let's give it the recognition that it deserves. Um, and I have no intention of stopping. Storytelling is too powerful. It makes too much of a difference. If you look at a student when you're telling them a story or even a person, the next time you're at dinner with someone or you're convening with a group of professionals, think about the attention you give when someone is telling a story that's deep rooted and meaningful to them. You can't help but listen and you can't help but acknowledge the meaning that it has. I just. I'm going to keep doing it. I have to. It's effective. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I definitely see there's a lot of power in storytelling, and we've seen that through the use of oral histories and all revolutionary movements. Um, so I do think there's definitely a rich history of storytelling. And I just want to thank you again for, uh, you know, elevating this key value of the SDGs, the leave no one behind agenda, which requires delivery, not just limited by race, class, gender, but also I like that you are doing this lens of first generation, second generation. Um, so I just wanna just share my appreciation for this work and, and thank you so much for speaking today. Um, if you, if anybody has any more questions, please put them in the Q&A, Lydia can answer them uh, through, like during the next presentation or uh, you know over chat. Um, so feel free to share that. Um, but since we do have a timed presentation, I'll just move on and thank you again, Lydia, for, for sharing your story. Um, the final presentation for our panel today is from the Metabolism of Cities Living Lab out of the Center for Human Dynamics in the Mobile Age at San Diego State University. Uh, it's titled Localizing the SDGs by Strengthening Diversity and Deliberation in Climate Adaption, Adaptation Planning in Southern California and the Baja California, Mexico region. Um, I just wanna thank Dr. Gabriela Fernandez, uh, Harmeet Chima and uh, Yaya Shaker of San Diego State University for presenting and taking the floor. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Dr. Gabriela Fernandez. I'm the director of the Metabolism of Cities Living Lab in the Department of Geography at San Diego State University. We're hosted under the Center for Human Dynamics in the Mobile Age um, in San Diego, California. Um, I will be uh, taking over my colleague, uh, Carol Mayone, who is the Associate Director of the Metabolism of Cities Living Lab. And we will have uh, Yaya Shaker be presenting a bit of our research that we have been doing in Southern California. Um, also um, our student, Harmit Shima, she's a Master of Science in Big Data Analytics program a student who will be presenting our dashboard. Uh, that we've been tracking the dashboards in Southern California and the Baja California, Mexico region. And uh, Yaya will be presenting the work that was created by Harrison Yang, who's also a big data analytics uh, student at San Diego State University. I will be discussing uh, localizing the sustainable development goals by straightening diversity and deliberation in climate adaptation planning in Southern California and the Baja California, Mexico region. It's important to um, be aware also of our international borders and how that, that has a huge effect on our Hispanic population and, and so on. So let's get started. I would like to start um, my presentation with a video of our laboratory. Let's 
believe there is something wrong with the mouse. Just a second. Okay, here we go. So this is just an overview about our panel that will be discussing some uh, research projects um, from our lab. All right, let's start with our video. The Metabolism of Cities Living Lab is a multi-actor network partnership of researchers, knowledge creators, and thought leaders connected together to mobilize expertise on the SDGs in Southern California and Baja California, Mexico region's overall performance. For vulnerable communities in Southern California, social, environmental, and economic injustices can be especially devastating during times of difficulty creating a divide between where we are and where we want to be. Diversity and inclusion isn't just about equality, it's about leaving no one behind and connecting us to each other during times of need. To our environment, to our communities, and to our neighbors. Connecting us to everything and everyone we love, we now have the opportunity to think differently about how we connect and plan our cities a chance to truly innovate across our metropolitan regions and international borders, a chance for cities to localize the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal targets for the development of the world to 2030. A catalyst for change is the Metabolism of Cities Living Lab, hosted by the Center for Human Dynamics in the Mobile Age at San Diego State University. The Living Lab will accommodate, enable, drive the diversity of individual communities by viewing the city as a living organism. We can imagine innovative ways to think of a city. We can track, monitor, and forecast material, energy, information, and people flows to localize the global goals. Driving progress, ambition, and vision to improve social, economic, and environmental outcomes in the local region. The international border is the playground of the Living Lab. Our Big Ideas vision leverages the integration of smart urban systems, citizen science, big data analysis, and model forecasting, with an overarching goal of providing data-driven tracking and monitoring of sustainability. As part of our toolkit, the SDSU Sustainable Development Goals Tracking Dashboard can monitor, explore sustainability trends, indicators, and related targets. The dashboard can enable us to visualize, analyze, and download data and help foster a strong community in the Baja Californias. Governments, academics, and others can use the dashboard to perform easy analysis of sustainability, important to make the decisions that affect our underrepresented communities. Our research outputs can provide a resource to higher education institutes through teaching, research, partnerships, dialogue, and organizational practices. We apply science and we engineer the future because it is exploring and solving that moves us forward. It lifts us. It's what makes the world better. It's what makes us SDSU. We believe that there's nothing in this world that can't be made better, more efficient, cleaner, smarter, more life-affirming, life-saving, and life-improving. So we discover, teach, ponder, and manage from the edges to its center. Our region can be more connected through thoughtful planning and careful execution. We reimagine SDSU as a leader in sustainable development in Southern California and the Baja California, Mexico region. To support the metabolism of Cities Living Lab, please check out our website. All right, getting back to our presentation. That was just an overview of the work that we're doing here at uh, San Diego State University. All right, so our um, Metabolism of Cities Living Lab is an international collaboration with uh, universities from all around the world, nonprofit organizations, as well as governmental agencies. You can see here uh, a map that displays the different areas scattered around. Um, our idea is to use multi-actor partnerships between universities, cities, individuals, and organizations using a very data-oriented solution 
We focus on underrepresented communities in Southern California. Um, for our case study, we focus, we focus on San Diego as well as the Imperial Valley. We will have a researcher, uh, Yaya, who will be presenting some of our, our research that we have uh, developed in the Imperial Valley uh, border with Mexico and Mexicali. Here is kind of a, a breakdown of our, of our, let's say, collaborators. Uh, we focus on the urban and the rural perspective. We have collaborations with uh, Imperial Valley, uh, Brawley, San Diego, uh, UABC, which is a Mexican university on both sides of the border in Mexicali, as well as Tijuana. And we include several different governmental partners as well as industries. Our, our, our idea is to, to leave no one behind using this uh, straining diversity and deliberation and climate adaptation planning perspective. We develop, uh, we focus on specific individual cities in Southern California using this concept of urban metabolism to view the city as a living organism in order to share knowledge, create knowledge, foster a community, as well as apply knowledge. Focusing on storytelling by understanding the differences between underrepresented communities along our US-Mexico border. The, the power of sharing data as well as developing a SDSU SDG tracking dashboard in order to help local governments localize the sustainable development goals. All right, so basically our idea is to leave no one behind. Um, I will now be presenting some of the work that we have been working on um, in place of my colleague, Carol Mayone. Uh, in San Diego, we currently have uh, five goals that have been uh, selected as priority. We have select we have categorized the 17 different goals in three different phases and um then having these five first five different sdg goals being our priority in terms of developing projects our metabolism of cities lab uh, focuses on developing a sdg pools toolkit the toolkit is composed of three different sections the sdsu sdg tracking dashboard which is about visualizing the data within the city about sdg actions looking at practical applications that fall underneath the city and developing citizen science um, tools that can be utilized by different researchers and local governments. Uh, my, uh, Harmit Shima will be presenting further on the SDSU SDG tracking dashboard, but here we have a, a small overview. We have been also measuring our longevity uh, by making sure that we focus on several different perspectives in terms of how we analyze our projects by making sure that we increase diversity, public survey and feedback. It's very important to understand uh, before and after change makers, tailor-based minority campaigns, big data and technology. Uh, funding awards, potential as well, domestic and international partnerships, company entrepreneurship, publication, podcasts and media, conferences and webinars and seminars. So this is our way of making sure we evaluate our own projects related to the SDGs. Here we have an example where we look at uh, what projects we're currently focusing on related to water. Uh, and so here we have some examples, which I will touch on um, further. So here for the SDGs in action within our toolkit, we have uh, projects that we are currently working on around the world with different collaborators. We can see here the SDGs that have been addressed pertaining to that particular project. We focus on several different uh, SDG goals. Here is uh, an example of microplastic pollution monitoring in the California Mexico coastal region using different types of technologies in order to monitor plastics from space as well as land. Uh, here is a collaboration that we have with the Academy in Ukraine where we're developing a uh, a device where you can uh, create energy from tidal waves and the idea is to develop it in the Ukraine and test it in San Diego. Uh, here is another project that we have worked on uh, during our COVID period. The idea is to use Twitter data in order to want better understand the behaviors of people during this period of time. We identified uh, 10 different keywords related to COVID and we could understand what are the top media news, the top hashtags, uh, and, and the different frequencies of Twitter data. I, in this particular project, we focused on 10 metropolitan cities in Italy. This was during the period where Italy was harshly hit. And here we can understand that the social response to COVID-19 uh, can in fact be very useful uh, using social media. 
Here we also develop an uh, international tracking survey to understand uh, the effects of people during COVID, their well-being, the perceptions and attitude that they had towards their government during this period of time, their behaviors and their movements, as well as other social economic indicators that we consider. Here we have a collaboration with UABC where we're using drone technologies in order to understand the waste um, on both sides of the borders. Also monitoring the pollution cycles. This is another collaboration that we are currently having with uh, Universidad Autónoma de Baja California. The idea is to develop a dashboard where we can understand uh, the different consumption behaviors between the different uh, areas, not only in the San Diego area, but also the Tijuana, Imperial Valley, and Mexicali area. Here we develop a toolkit where we develop seven different campaigns um, um, uh, with seven different targets on people with disabilities, children, homeless and refugees, LGBT community, women. And the idea was to better understand the, these different vulnerable groups, how they are affected by climate change, how they are perceiving the sustainable development goals and are being educated. The idea is to make sure that we develop tailor-based uh, uh, solutions that governments should not educate their citizens in only a one way, but look at different uh, multidimensional. And also the importance of citizen science. We developed several different tools and projects like comic books, um, campaigns targeting minority groups, uh, microplastics and marine litter policy in youth and beach litter surveys. And here are some examples of some projects that we're working on. Here is a small video about the urban metabolism, but I think uh, due to the, well, I, I can demonstrate it really quickly about this concept. Since 2007, for the first time in history, more people live in cities than in rural areas. Cities consume 75% of Earth's resources and account for 60 to 80% of global greenhouse gas emissions, and they're growing by the second. By 2050, more than two thirds of the world's population will live in cities. Limits to Earth's resources challenge the ability of cities to accommodate this growth. At the rate at which humanity consumes today, we would require the equivalent of 1.6 Earths to continue to meet our resource needs and absorb our wastes. But we only have one. To live within the planet's boundaries and improve quality of life for the poor, we need to achieve more with less. Cities must supply services in ways that are resource efficient, climate friendly, resilient and equitable. Urban metabolism studies help us to understand what happens to resources in a city between their points of entry and their exit from the city as wastes. By viewing the city as an organism that consumes resources and produces wastes, we can find ways to improve resource use and reduce environmental impact. Many cities have what is called a linear metabolism, where the vast majority of resources that enter the city leave it again as solid, liquid and airborne wastes. The key to a sustainable, resilient city is to harness these wastes as resources. This results in resource flow loops and a circular metabolism. For example, wastewater treatment plants can go beyond cleaning water to capture methane for energy and nutrients to enrich the soil. Recirculating these resources within the city can reduce resource imports and wastes. Urban metabolism studies can be used to identify appropriate infrastructure and planning interventions that will save resources.
Oh no, I think we might have temporarily lost uh, Dr. Fernandez. Um, if there are any questions for any of the other hosts while we wait to see um, if she can get back on, please put them in the Q&A and we can address them now. Uh, I know there was a good discussion happening around uh, Lydia's presentation. Um, so if anybody has any further questions on that or, or for Dr. Moeller who's still on the line as well, um, please feel free to ask them and we can, and we can address them now. Um, does anybody from Dr. Fernandez's group know where she is or want to uh, take over? Oh no. <laughs> okay, Carmi, that would be great if you could go ahead. Thank you so much for being flexible. Um, hello, like um, Dr. Gabriela Fernandez was just like, uh, she's really sorry her uh, computer just shut down for a technical issue. And I think we're gonna be proceeding with uh, the presentation for Harmit until she's back again with us. So yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you both. Can, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. So hello all. It is a delight to meet you all at this event. Um, today I will be introducing the project San Diego State University SDGs Tracking Dashboard, where we talk about SDG 6, clean water and sanitation for all in San Diego County. I should probably present this. Um, So my name's Hermie. I am a second year big data analytics master's student at SDSU. I also did my undergrad here in statistics. Um, here in California, we have what we call the water crisis. Um, the northern part of the state, about 80 miles north of the capital, um, Sacramento, California, obtains 75% of its water. However, 80% of the demand occurs in the southern portion of the state. So California has an extremely special climate. It experiences extended periods of drought and major floods. It should be no surprise that these variables impact low income communities the most. Um, an example of this is groundwater running dry in specific areas. So the sustainable development goals contain a total of 17 goals. From these goals, we separated them into three phases. We are currently in the first phase, which contain five priority SDGs. These SDGs focus on water, energy, infrastructure, sustainable cities, and sustainable manufacturing. So like I said prior, for this presentation, we are focusing on SDG 6, water. Um, SDG 6 is actually the most recent iteration of the United Nations aim to address water related issues. And a huge reason for that is just because the world needs to transform the way it manages, manages its water resources and delivers water and sanitation services for billions of people because water is in fact a non-renewable natural resource. This was adopted at the 2015 UN summit as part of the 2030 agenda for sustainable development to provide clean water and sanitation for all. So next, I want to talk about the SDG 6 indicators. Um, within SDG 6, there are smaller goals within it, and those are called indicators. SDG 6 has a total of 11 indicators. Um, all of them are connected to the overall goal of ensuring availability and sustainability management of water and sanitation for all. Um, so to visualize SDG 6, we created a dashboard to provide a clear assessment of the current state of the environment in Southern California across relevant scales to enable and inform our audience of the tracking of the sustainable development goal targets in San Diego County and in the future Imperial County. Our lab recognizes that in order to achieve the global goals, it's crucial for people to acquire knowledge, values, and skills 
to enable communities to better respond to the external challenges while promoting more equitable, inclusive, and resilient societies. With this dashboard, we hope to bridge the gap between science, civic engagement, and policy by turning the best available scientific knowledge into information that's relevant for decision makers. Now I wanna highlight three important reasons why dashboard and visualizations are in fact important. First, it creates, shares, and applies knowledge. It creates a great way to seek ideas and aid SDSU and SoCal to meet their climate action plan goals, as well as harness the unique capacity for a research institution to demonstrate climate solutions. Finally, planning for a low carbon future at SDSU presents unique challenges and opportunities to demonstrate climate savvy planning, building and engineering, as well as human engagement and innovation. And a dashboard is a great way to showcase that. Now I want to touch on our study area, San Diego County. Um, so the county's water needs have out outnumbered the local supply of rain. And with a place as beautiful as San Diego, the population continues to grow. The city of San Diego purchases approximately 90% of its water. Um, within San Diego, there are actually nine reservoirs that exist. They also treat wastewater to a level that is approved for irrigation manufacturing and other non-drinking or non-potable purposes. Next, I, I just wanna briefly touch on our dashboard. Um, portions of the San Diego population live without safely managed drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene services. COVID-19 has underscored the need for universal access to these services to combat the pandemic and pro promote a healthy, green, and sustainable recovery. Water is required across all sectors of society to produce food, energy, goods, and services. Many water sources are drying up, becoming more polluted or both. Um, in addition to water stress and water pollution, San Diego County is facing growing challenges linked to degraded water related issues. So in this dashboard, we focus on um, 6.1.1, which is safe and affordable drinking water. Um, we're also focusing on improving water quality, wastewater treatment, and safer use. Um, how San Diego County is implementing integrated water resources management, as well as their wetlands, rivers, and lakes. And so due to how advanced San Diego County has been in recent years, it is important to note how much it is being spent by water districts. In the dashboard, you can view the amount spent on infrastructure access, storage, supply reliability, which is the shortages that result from failures of a system's physical components, as well as customer service. So further investigation on the city of San Diego would provide deeper insight on why their costs overshadow all surrounding watersheds. Where as seen in our map, most of the watersheds are located along the coast. Um, from there, we also showcase potable water per total population from the year 2009 to 2019, me metered irrigation water use in San Diego County, and recycled water use in San Diego County, all necessary to monitor and track the county's progress for reaching the SDG 6 target date of 2030. So following our methodology, it's important because Within this lab, we reconsider how societies function, how economies flow, and how we interact with our planet to build equitable, inclusive, and sustainable environments. We also have over 30 multidisciplinary members from the United States of America, um, Mexico, as, as well as international thought leaders from Italy, France, Ukraine. And it's imperative that we have all hands on deck when addressing this issue, where we can learn from cities and they can learn from us. So our next steps include implementing the SDG 6 dashboard for Imperial County, um, continue the process for the rest of the SDGs in phase one, obtain and incorporate real-time data, and also continue to grow and expand locally and internationally. 
So I provided our contact information as well as the QR code, which takes you to our website. References. And I just want to thank everybody for having me. Yeah, yeah. Would you like to share your screen or would you like me to? Sure, I can share it from here. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, um, uh, so um, you would continue sharing it from the, your oh, part. No, sorry, okay. I can. No you, no, you can keep going. Yeah, perfect. So, okay. um, <laughs> sorry for the confusion. So, um, um, I'm Yaya Shaker. I'm a, a researcher at the Metabolism of Cities Living Lab at the Center of Human Dynamics in the Mobile, mobile Age uh, in San Diego State University. So, I'm really honored to be here with you at the SDSN uh, USA with special focus on uh, the Hispanic heritage. So I will be presenting today um, research conducted by Harrison Yang. He's a MS student in big data analytics program at San Diego State University. Um, so to, I would be uh, running through this presentation and taking you a little bit in depth with some uh, data analytics as before it was mentioned, uh, during the um, previous presentations that it's really important to give a little bit of eye to detail to the data and uh, statistics, which would be helping us for sure to be building up uh, a concrete statement. So we're going to be talking about the travel distance and cancer care among rural cancer patients in the U.S.-Mexico border region. And this would be connected with the localization of the U.N. SDGs in the Southern California and Baja California, Mexico region. Um, can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so the research background, basically, we're addressing and um, eliminating healthcare disparities in the minority populations uh, is growing focus uh, uh, in a lot of research in the public health domain. Uh, geographic barriers to cancer diagnosis and treatment are largely um, exacerbated by travel distances and neighboring uh, uh, neighborhood socioeconomic status. In current literature, we have lack of related studies for rural settings to explore this issue. The study aims to, ex uh, to examine the effects of travel distance and neighborhood, uh, neighborhood socioeconomic status on cancer diagnosis and cancer treatment, respectively among the rural cancer patients living in Imperial County, located in South California, and which is basically adjacent to the US-Mexico border. Uh, next slide, please. So in the research methodology here, as we can see, we're uh, looking at the map in the Imperial County. So we're talking about a, a very specific uh, geographic location. And we have here um, um, a lot of um, concentration of vulnerable groups, especially as well from the um, Hispanic uh, people that they're living in that area due to the uh, connections between the Mexico and the USA. And basically, we are uh, in this uh, research, we were working on secondary data analysis using an intake data from nonprofit cancer organizations, the CRCD. The data that we have been collected and analyzed was in the period between 2006, 2019, just before the COVID period, of total of 2,086 patients intake information were used basically to be analyzed and we'll be going through this uh, analysis in the next slides. With the Tableau and the ArcGIS, we used it to be analyzing from geographically as well and with geobases uh, information about these different variables. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, so here is uh, there's some interesting uh, data that was ex extracted from this uh, analysis that have been carried out before. So as you see here on the right um, uh, graph, we have age distribution of patients. So if you can see on the, from 41 to 64 of age, uh, we have the highest uh, numbers of uh, patients basically in the, affected by the, the cancer uh, issue and the 65 and older. So in this range, which are the most vulnerable age uh, group, they are scoring the highest in the, according to the sample of the 2086 uh, that we are, were analyzed. And as well for the gender distribution, we found that 60% of this sample were females. And this is going to be important in our analysis in the further slides. So we can go to the next one, please. 
So here as well, uh, we did a little bit of in-depth uh, analysis to understand as well about uh, the family uh, formation. So here we have like a, a little bit of uh, an insight on the marital status distribution of patients. So uh, the highest concentration of uh, the people affected by this were 56, almost 57-ish percent, which is the highest uh, um, percentage in this 1,791 uh, sample, which means that this problem is not affecting just individuals, but it goes on the level as well of the, uh, the family. Um, we can see as well in the race uh, ethnicity uh, on a sample of 2062, the highest records where we're talking about 85.69. So we're talking about the majority basically were Hispanic uh, uh, people, so we need uh, just, it, for instance, and in, in relatively with all the other uh, ethnicities, so that's why it's really important to give uh, special focus on this. Uh, and this will going to be like uh, presented as well in the next slides, <clears throat> so we can go to the next one, please. So yeah, here, um, previously I was saying it's important to uh, look at um, the 60% of the affected uh, population were from females, because as you see here on the right uh, side, we are talking about the top 10 cancer diagnosis distribution of patients, and the highest is recorded for breast, which is affecting mostly uh, females. So as you can see here from the numbers, okay, like uh, the data that we have from 2079, we have like, breast cancer is almost like we're talking about like 30.45 percent and from the prostate which is mostly like in the male sample we're talking about 9.2 percent so we can see uh, there's a huge difference uh, between both of them and uh as well in in the previous uh, slides we're talking about like uh why this is important to give uh, a great um, focus on uh, the family members and because like um, when we're talking about um, uh, a vulnerable group and it's a, the, with a special uh, focus on the Hispanic people and the most uh, people affecting from this sample are females, I think this uh, needs to be taken into account in building our statement for uh, future uh, um, actions. Uh, I think by here we can go to the next slide as well. Um, here we're going to be uh, going into a little bit of in-depth uh, insights, let's say, on the cancer stage categorized by different age groups. So we can see here, as you can see on the, uh, uh, with the red bars, we have over 40% of the patients who are 65 and older were diagnosed at stage four, which we're talking about, like if you see in the upper right uh, part, we have from stage zero to stage four. So we're talking about a very late stage of uh, diagnosis and we're talking about 65 and older of an age. So that's a really uh, critical uh, um, area where we're talking about the very, very uh, vulnerable uh, situation. And we have over 70% over of the young population among, uh, let's say from newborn to 19 were diagnosed at stage three or four. We can run to the next slide, please. Yeah, here we can see like um, more analysis on the cancer stage categorized by different ethnicity. We're talking about Hispanic versus non-Hispanic whites. And according to this figures, as you can see here on the left part, where we're having the percentage of diagnosed at stage three or four is greater for non-Hispanic whites than for the Hispanic people. So this as well uh, needs to be taken in consideration uh, for uh, not just future research, uh, future uh, research, but as well for building our statement and taking serious actions on this. Um, but here we'd like as well to give you <clears throat> some insights regarding the female breast cancer. Non-Hispanic white groups is more likely to be diagnosed as stage three or four rather than the Hispanic group. And um, if you take like a couple of uh, seconds to be looking at uh, this uh, diagrams. Um, uh, next slide, please. It's here as well for the terms of the prostate uh, cancer. Hispanic groups are more likely to be diagnosed as stage four and, uh, than the non-Hispanic white groups. Next one, please. The 
G-coding procedures, we have like three steps, like the eliminating the invalid data on the original data sets. And then we're obtaining the coordinates, latitude and longitudes on the hospitals of the resident of patients, and then marking the, the location of um, hospitals. Uh, by here, I would like to start going through the, my conclusion, so we can go to the next one. Yeah, for this sample, we have 1,281, which is we're focusing on the first uh, medical patients with one medical facility, so we can go to the next one as well. Um, here we have the um, direct distance versus the network distance one. Um, so it's an example on the calculation of the distance that has been to be crossed over by street networks as well as the actual distance for the service between where the people are located and where they're getting the service in the hospitals. Next one, please. And again, we're going into uh, uh, other uh, samples on the non-Hispanic whites. They have to be, uh, has farther average traveling distance than other ethnicities. Next one, please. And the young age groups from newborns to 19, they have further uh, average traveling distance than the older groups, as you can see on the left part of the, in the bars presented there. Next one, please. And again, by here, we're going into the never married groups has farther average traveling distance uh, rather than the other groups. Um, finally, we'd like to acknowledge um, and appreciate uh, Mr. Helen Palamino and the CEO staff and the patients of the CRCD where the samples were collected and the support of the assistance there. We as well appreciate all the information that was presented and uh, to us by the Center of Human Dynamics. And by here, I would like to be <laughs> closing my uh, presentation. So we'll be here uh, to listen to your questions, if anything to be clarified. And thanks for having me here. Yeah, thank you to the entire team um, at the Metabolism of Cities Living Lab. Uh, we really appreciate it. I think that we just are a little short on time. We're going a little over, so we might not an answer any questions live. Um, but if you want to share contact information, I know a lot of folks were interested in how they might partner with you or ask further questions in the future. So please feel free to drop those in the chat. Um, and with the permission of the team, maybe we can share those slides so that people can look a little more in depth on that research. Um, if they were interested. Uh, and sorry, everyone, again, for going over, but as you can see, we are just so rich in the type of research that's happening throughout our network that it's just too hard to stop once we start. Um, but thanks again to uh, all those who presented today and all those who joined in. I dropped in the chat um, our website and other places you can follow the SDSN USA network. Um, and I think yeah, I'm just looking forward to future collaborations with these researchers and with everyone who joined today. Um, and thank you for We Are All Human and Helen for coming out to give opening remarks and just really kick off a great event. Um, but please reach out. People are still dropping uh, contacts in the chat, so I won't close off so people can, can save those. Um, but yeah, really, really great presentation. And, and thanks again. All right. Bye everyone. Bye Claudia. Bye Helen. Bye TMET. SDSU.